Hello, and welcome to Family Folk Tales from the Nashville Public Library. I'm Susan Poulter, a librarian at the Main Library. Today I'll be reading part one of The Adventures of Prince Kamaralazam and Princess Badura. This is part eight of our stories from The Arabian Nights Entertainments, selected and edited by Andrew Lang. The Adventures of Prince Kamar al Azan and the Princess Badura, Part 1. Some twenty days' sail from the coast of Persia lies the Isle of the Children of Khaladan. The island is divided into several provinces, in each of which are large flourishing towns, and the whole forms an important kingdom. It was governed in former days by a king named Shazaman who, with good right, considered himself one of the most peaceful, prosperous, and fortunate monarchs on the earth. In fact, he had but one grievance, which was that none of his four wives had given him an heir. This distressed him so greatly that one day he confided his grief to the Grand Vizier, who, being a wise counselor, said, Such matters are indeed beyond human aid. Allah alone can grant your desire, and I should advise you, sire, to send large gifts to those holy men who spend their lives in prayer, and to beg for their intercessions. Who knows whether their petitions may not be answered? The king took his vizier's advice, and the result of so many prayers for an heir to the throne was that a son was born to him the following year. Shah Zaman sent noble gifts as thank offerings to all the mosques and religious houses, and great rejoicings were celebrated in honor of the birth of the little prince, who was so beautiful that he was named Kamar al Zaman, or Moon of the Century. Prince Kamar al Zaman was brought up with extreme care by an excellent governor and all the cleverest teachers and he did such credit to them that when he was grown up, a more charming and accomplished young man was not to be found. Whilst he was still a youth, the king, his father, who loved him dearly, had some thoughts of abdicating in his favor. As usual, he talked over his plans with his grand vizier, who, though he did not approve the idea, would not state all his objections. Sire, he replied, the prince is still very young for the cares of state. Your majesty fears his growing idle and careless, and doubtless you are right. But how would it be if he were first to marry? This would attach him to his home, and your majesty might give him a share in your counsels, so that he might gradually learn how to wear a crown, which you can give up to him whenever you find him capable of wearing it. The vizier's advice once more struck the king as being good, and he sent for his son, who lost no time in obeying the summons, and standing respectfully with downcast eyes before the king, asked for his commands. I have sent for you, said the king, to say that I wish you to marry. What do you think about it? The prince was so overcome by these words that he remained silent for some time. At length he said, Sire, I beg you to pardon me if I am unable to reply as you might wish. I certainly did not expect such a proposal as I am still so young, and I confess that the idea of marrying is very distasteful to me. Possibly I may not always be in this mind, but I certainly feel that it will require some time to induce me to take the step which your majesty desires. This answer greatly distressed the king, who was sincerely grieved by his objection to marriage. However, he would not have recourse to extreme measures, so he said, I do not wish to force you. I will give you time to reflect, but remember that such a step is necessary for a prince such as you who will some day be called to rule over a great kingdom. From this time, Prince Kamar al-Zaman was admitted to the royal council, and the king showed him every mark of favor. At the end of a year, the king took his son aside and said, 
Well, my son, have you changed your mind on the subject of marriage? Or do you still refuse to obey my wish? The prince was less surprised, but no less firm than on the former occasion, and begged his father not to press the subject, adding that it was quite useless to urge him any longer. This answer much distressed the king, who again confided his trouble to the vizier. I have followed your advice, he said, but Kamar al-Zaman declines to marry and is more obstinate than ever. Sire, replied the vizier, much is gained by patience, and your majesty might regret any violence. Why not wait another year, and then inform the prince in the midst of the assembled council that the good of the state demands his marriage? He cannot possibly refuse again before so distinguished an assemblage and in our immediate presence. The sultan ardently desired to see his son married at once, but he yielded to the vizier's arguments and decided to wait. He then visited the prince's mother, and after telling her of his disappointment and of the further respite he had given his son, he added, I know that Kamar al-Zaman confides more in you than he does in me. Pray speak very seriously to him on this subject, and make him realize that he will most seriously displease me if he remains obstinate, and that he will certainly regret the measures I shall be obliged to take to enforce my will. So the first time the Sultana Fatima saw her son, she told him she had heard of his refusal to marry, adding how distressed she felt that he should have vexed his father so much. She asked what reasons he could have for his objections to obey. Madam, replied the prince, I make no doubt that there are as many good, virtuous, sweet, and amiable women as there are others very much the reverse. Would that all were like you! But what revolts me is the idea of marrying a woman without knowing anything at all about her. My father will ask the hand of the daughter of some neighboring sovereign who will give his consent to our union. Be she fair or frightful, clever or stupid, good or bad, I must marry her, and am left no choice in the matter. How am I to know that she will not be proud, passionate, contemptuous, and recklessly extravagant, or that her disposition will in any way suit mine? But my son, urged Fatima, you surely do not wish to be the last of a race which has reigned so long and so gloriously over this kingdom. Madam, said the prince, I have no wish to survive the king, my father, but should I do so, I will try to reign in such a manner as may be considered worthy of my predecessors. These and similar conversations proved to the sultan how useless it was to argue with his son, and the year elapsed without bringing any change in the prince's ideas. At length a day came when the sultan summoned him before the council, and there informed him that not only his own wishes, but the good of the empire demanded his marriage, and desired him to give his answer before the assembled ministers. At this, Kamar al-Zaman grew so angry and spoke with so much heat that the king, naturally irritated at being opposed by his son in full council, ordered the prince to be arrested and locked up in an old tower, where he had nothing but a very little furniture, a few books, and a single slave to wait on him. Kamar al-Zaman, pleased to be free to enjoy his books, showed himself very indifferent to his sentence. When night came, he washed himself, performed his devotions, and, having read some pages of the Koran, lay down on a couch, without putting out the light near him, and was soon asleep. Now, there was a deep well in the tower in which Prince Kamar al-Zaman was imprisoned, and this well was a favorite resort of the fairy Maimun, daughter of Damriat, chief of a legion of genies. Towards midnight, Maimun floated lightly up from the well, intending, according to her usual habit, to roam about the upper world as curiosity or accident might prompt. The light in the prince's room surprised her, and without disturbing the slave who slept across the threshold, she entered the room, 
and approaching the bed, was still more astonished to find it occupied. The prince lay with his face half hidden by the coverlet. My moon lifted it a little and beheld the most beautiful youth she had ever seen. What a marvel of beauty he must be when his eyes are open, she thought. What can he have done to deserve to be treated like this? She could not weary gazing at Kamar al-Zaman, but at length, having softly kissed his brow and each cheek, she replaced the coverlet and resumed her flight through the air. As she entered the middle region, she heard the sound of great wings coming towards her, and shortly met one of the race of bad genies. This genie, whose name was Danash, recognized Mamun with terror, for he knew the supremacy which her goodness gave her over him. He would gladly have avoided her altogether, but they were so near that he must either be prepared to fight or yield to her. So he at once addressed her in a conciliatory tone. Could my moon swear to me by Allah to do me no harm, and on my side I will promise not to injure you? Accursed genie, replied my moon, what harm can you do me? But I will grant your power and give the promise you ask. And now tell me what you have seen and done tonight. Fair lady, said Danash, you meet me at the right moment to hear something really interesting. I must tell you that I come from the furthest end of China, which is one of the largest and most powerful kingdoms in the world. The present king has only one daughter, who is so perfectly lovely that neither you nor I nor any other creature could find adequate terms in which to describe her marvelous charms. You must therefore picture to yourself the most perfect features joined to a brilliant and delicate complexion and an enchanting expression, and even then imagination will fall short of the reality. The king, her father, has carefully shielded this treasure from the vulgar gaze and has taken every precaution to keep her from the sight of everyone except the happy mortal he may choose to be her husband. But in order to give her variety in her confinement, he has built her seven palaces such as have never been seen before. The first palace is entirely composed of rock crystal, the second of bronze, the third of fine steel, the fourth of another and more precious species of bronze, the fifth of touchstone, the sixth of silver, and the seventh of solid gold. They are all most sumptuously furnished, whilst the gardens surrounding them are laid out with exquisite taste. In fact, neither trouble nor cost has been spared to make this retreat agreeable to the princess. The report of her wonderful beauty has spread far and wide, and many powerful kings have sent embassies to ask her hand in marriage. The king has always received these embassies graciously, but says that he will never oblige the princess to marry against her will. And as she regularly declines each fresh proposal, the envoys have had to leave as disappointed in the result of their missions as they were gratified by their magnificent receptions. Sire, said the princess to her father, you wish me to marry, and I know you desire to please me, for which I am very grateful. But indeed I have no inclination to change my state, for where could I find so happy a life amid so many beautiful and delightful surroundings? I feel that I could never be as happy with any husband as I am here, and I beg you to not press one on me. At last an embassy came from a king so rich and powerful that the king of China felt constrained to urge this suit on his daughter. He told her how important such an alliance would be and pressed her to consent. In fact, he pressed her so persistingly that the princess at length lost her temper and quite forgot the respect due to her father. Sire, she cried angrily, do not speak further of this or any other marriage, or I will plunge this dagger in my breast and so escape from all these importunities. 
the king of China was extremely indignant with his daughter and replied, You have lost your senses, and you must be treated accordingly. So he had her shut in one set of rooms in one of her palaces, and only allowed her ten old women, of whom her nurse was the head, to wait on her and keep her company. He next sent letters to all the kings who had sued for the princess's hand, begging they would think of her no longer as she was quite insane, and he desired his various envoys to make it known that anyone who could cure her should have her to wife. Fair my moon, continued Danash, this is the present state of affairs. I never pass a day without going to gaze on this incomparable beauty, and I am sure that if you would only accompany me, you would think the sight well worth the trouble, and own that you never saw such loveliness before. The fairy only answered with a peal of laughter, and when at length she had control of her voice, she cried, Oh, come, you are making game of me. I thought you had something really interesting to tell me instead of raving about some unknown damsel. What would you say if you could see the prince I have just been looking at and whose beauty is really transcendent? That is something worth talking about you would certainly quite lose your head. Charming my moon, asked Danash, may I inquire who and what is the prince of whom you speak? No, replied Mamun, that he is in much the same case as your princess. The king, his father, wanted to force him to marry, and on the prince's refusal to obey, he has been imprisoned in an old tower where I have just seen him. I don't like to contradict a lady, said Danash, but you must really permit me to doubt any mortal being as beautiful as my princess. Hold your tongue, cried my moon. I repeat, that is impossible. Well, I don't wish to seem obstinate, replied Danash. The best plan is to test the truth of what I say will be for you to let me take you to see the princess for yourself. There's no need for that, retorted my moon. We can satisfy ourselves in another way. Bring your princess here and lay her down beside my prince. We can then compare them at leisure and decide which is in the right. Danash readily consented, and after having the tower where the prince was confined pointed out to him, and making a wager with Maimun as to the result of the comparison, he flew off to China to fetch the princess. In an incredibly short time, Danash returned, bearing the sleeping princess. My moon led him to the prince's room, and the rival beauty was placed beside him. When the prince and princess lay thus, side by side, an animated dispute as to their respective charms arose between the fairy and the genie. Danash began by saying, Now you see that my princess is more beautiful than your prince. Can you doubt any longer? Doubt? Of course I do, exclaimed my moon. Why, you must be blind not to see how much my prince excels your princess. I do not deny that your princess is very handsome. But only look, and you must own that I am in the right. There is no need for me to look longer, said Danash. My first impression will remain the same. But of course, charming my moon, I am ready to yield to you if you insist on it. By no means, replied my moon. I have no idea of being under any obligation to an accursed genie like you. I refer the matter to an umpire and shall expect you to submit to his verdict. Danash readily agreed, and on my moon striking the floor with her foot, it opened, and a hideous hump-backed, Lame, squinting genie with six horns on his head, hands like claws, emerged. As soon as he beheld my moon, he threw himself at her feet and asked her commands. Rise, Kashkash, said she. I summoned you to judge between me and Danash. Glance at that couch and say without any partiality whether you think the youth or the maiden lying there the more beautiful. Kashkash looked at the prince and princess with every token of surprise and admiration. At length, 
Having gazed long without being able to come to a decision, he said, Madam, I must confess that I should deceive you, were I to declare one to be handsomer than the other. There seems to me only one way in which to decide the matter, and that is to wake one after the other and judge which of them expresses the greater admiration for the other. This advice pleased Maimun and Danash, and the fairy at once transformed herself into the shape of a gnat, and settling on Kamar al-Zaman's throat, stung him so sharply that he awoke. As he did so, his eyes fell on the princess of China. Surprised at finding a lady so near him, he raised himself on one arm to look at her. The youth and beauty of the princess at once awoke a feeling to which his heart had as yet been a stranger, and he could not restrain his delight. What loveliness! What charms! Oh, my heart, my soul! he exclaimed, as he kissed her forehead, her eyes, and mouth, in a way which would certainly have roused her had not the genie's enchantments kept her asleep. How, fair lady, he cried, you do not wake at the signs of Kamar al-Zaman's love. Be you who you may, he is not unworthy of you. It then suddenly occurred to him that perhaps this was the bride his father had destined for him, and that the king had probably had her placed in this room in order to see how far Kamar al-Zaman's aversion to marriage would withstand her charms. At all events, he thought, I will take this ring as a remembrance of her. So saying, he drew off a fine ring which the princess wore on her finger and replaced it with one of his own. After which he lay down again and was soon fast asleep. Then Danash, in his turn, took the form of a gnat and bit the princess on her lip. She started up and was not a little amazed at seeing a young man beside her. From surprise, she soon passed to admiration, and then to delight on perceiving how handsome and fascinating he was. Why, cried she, was it you my father wished me to marry? How unlucky that I did not know sooner. I should not have made him so angry. But wake up, wake up, for I know I shall love you with all my heart. So saying, she shook Kamar al-Zaman so violently that nothing but the spells of Maimun could have prevented his waking. Oh, cried the princess, why are you so drowsy? So saying, she took his hand and noticed her own ring on his finger, which made her wonder still more. But as he still remained in a profound slumber, she pressed a kiss on his cheek, and soon fell fast asleep too. Then Maimun, turning to the genie, said, Well, are you satisfied that my prince surpasses your princess? Another time, pray believe me when I assert anything. Then, turning to Kashkash, My thanks to you, and now do you and Danash bear the princess back to her own home. The two genies hastened to obey, and my moon returned to her well. On waking next morning, the first thing Prince Kamar al-Zaman did was to look round for the lovely lady he had seen at night, and the next to question the slave who waited on him about her. But the slave persisted so strongly that he knew nothing of any lady, and still less of how she got into the tower, that the prince lost all patience, and after giving him a good beating, tied a rope round him and ducked him in the well till the unfortunate man cried out that he would tell everything. Then the prince drew him up, all dripping wet, but the slave begged leave to change his clothes first, and as soon as the prince consented, hurried off just as he was to the palace. Here he found the king talking to the grand vizier of all the anxiety his son had caused him. The slave was admitted at once and cried, Alas, sire, I bring sad news to your majesty. There can be no doubt that the prince has completely lost his senses. He declares that he saw a lady sleeping on his couch last night, and the state you see me in proves how violent contradiction makes him. He then gave 
a minute account of all the prince had said and done. The king, much moved, begged the vizier to examine into this new misfortune, and the latter at once went to the tower, where he found the prince quietly reading a book. After the first exchange of greetings, the vizier said, I feel really angry with your slave for alarming his majesty by the news he brought him. What news? asked the prince. Ah, replied the vizier, something absurd, I feel sure, seeing how I find you. Most likely, said the prince. But now that you are here, I am glad of the opportunity to ask you, where is the lady who slept in this room last night? The grand vizier felt beside himself at this question. Prince, he exclaimed, how would it be possible for any man, much less a woman, to enter this room at night without walking over your slave on the threshold? Pray consider the matter, and you will realize that you have been deeply impressed by some dream. But the prince angrily insisted on knowing who and where the lady was, and was not to be persuaded at all by the vizier's protestations to the contrary that the plot had not been one of his making. At last, losing patience, he seized the vizier by the beard and loaded him with blows. Stop, prince, cried the unhappy vizier. Stay and hear what I have to say. The prince, whose arm was getting tired, paused. I confess, prince, said the vizier, that there is some foundation for what you say. But you know well that a minister has to carry out his master's orders. Allow me to go and to take to the king any message you may choose to send. Very well, said the prince. Then go and tell him that I consent to marry the lady whom he sent or brought here last night. Be quick and bring me back his answer. The vizier bowed to the ground and hastened to leave the room and tower. Well, asked the king as soon as he appeared, and how did you find my son? Alas, sire, was the reply. The slave's report is only too true. He then gave an exact account of his interview with Kamar al-Zaman and of the prince's fury when he told that it was not possible for any lady to have entered his room and of the treatment he himself had received. The king, much distressed, determined to clear up the matter himself, and, ordering the vizier to follow him, set out to visit his son. The prince received his father with profound respect, and the king, making him sit beside him, asked him several questions, to which Kamar al-Zaman replied with much good sense. At last the king said, My son, Pray tell me about the lady who, it is said, was in your room last night. Sire, replied the prince, pray do not increase my distress in this matter, but rather make me happy by giving her to me in marriage. However much I may have objected to matrimony formerly, the sight of this lovely girl has overcome all my prejudices, and I will gratefully receive her from your hands. The king was almost speechless on hearing his son but after a time assured him most solemnly that he knew nothing whatever about the lady in question and had not connived at her appearance. He then desired the prince to relate the whole story to him. Kamar al-Zaman did so at great length, showed the ring, and implored his father to help him find the bride he so ardently desired. After all you tell me, remarked the king, I can no longer doubt your word, but how and whence the lady came, or why she should have stayed so short a time, I cannot imagine. The whole affair is indeed mysterious. Come, my dear son, let us wait together for happier days. So saying, the king took Kamar al-Zaman by the hand and led him back to the palace, where the prince took to his bed and gave himself up to despair and the king, shutting himself up with his son, entirely neglected the affairs of state. The prime minister, who was the only person admitted, felt it his duty at last to tell the king how much the court and all the people complained of his seclusion, and how bad it was for the nation. He urged the sultan to remove with the prince to a lovely little island close by, 
whence he could easily attend public audiences, and where the charming scenery and fine air would do the invalid so much good as to enable him to bear his father's occasional absence. The king approved the plan, and as soon as the castle on the island could be prepared for their reception, he and the prince arrived there, Shah Zaman never leaving his son, except for the prescribed public audiences twice a week. Whilst all this was happening in the capital of Shah Zaman, the two genies had carefully borne the princess of China back to her own palace and replaced her in bed. On waking next morning, she first turned from one side to the other, and then, finding herself alone, called loudly for her women. Tell me, she cried, where is the young man I love so dearly, and who slept near me last night? Princess, exclaimed the nurse, we cannot tell what you allude to without more explanation. Why, continued the princess, the most charming and beautiful young man lay sleeping beside me last night. I did my utmost to wake him, but in vain. Your royal highness wishes to make game of us, said the nurse. Is it your pleasure to rise? I am quite in earnest, persisted the princess, and I want to know where he is. But princess, expostulated the nurse, we left you quite alone last night, and we have seen no one enter your room since then. At this, the princess lost all patience, and taking the nurse by her hair, she boxed her ears soundly, crying out, You shall tell me, you old witch, or I'll kill you. The nurse had no trouble in escaping, and hurried off to the queen, to whom she related the whole story with tears in her eyes. You see, madam, she concluded, that the princess must be out of her mind. If only you will come and see her, you will be able to judge for yourself. The queen hurried to her daughter's apartments, and after tenderly embracing her, asked her why she had treated her nurse so badly. Madam, said the princess, I perceive that your majesty wishes to make game of me, but I can assure you that I will never marry anyone except the charming young man whom I saw last night. You must know where he is, so pray send for him. The queen was much surprised by these words, but when she declared that she knew nothing whatever of the matter, the princess lost all respect and answered that if she were not allowed to marry as she wished, she should kill herself, and it was in vain that the queen tried to pacify her and bring her to reason. The king himself came to hear the rights of the matter, but the princess only persisted in her story and, as a proof, showed the ring on her finger. The king hardly knew what to make of it all, but ended by thinking that his daughter was more crazy than ever, and without further argument he had her placed in still closer confinement, with only her nurse to wait on her and a powerful guard to keep the door. Then he assembled his council, and having told them the sad state of things, added, If any of you can succeed in curing the princess, I will give her to him in marriage, and he shall be my heir. An elderly emir present, fired with the desire to possess a young and lovely wife and to rule over a great kingdom, offered to try the magic arts with which he was acquainted. You are welcome to try, said the king, but I make one condition, which is that should you fail, you will lose your life. The emir accepted the condition, and the king led him to the princess, who, veiling her face, remarked, I am surprised, sire, that you should bring an unknown man into my presence. You need not be shocked, said the king. This is one of my emirs who asks your hand in marriage. Sire, replied the princess, this is not the one you gave me before and whose ring I wear. Permit me to say that I can accept no other. The emir, who had expected to hear the princess talk nonsense, finding how calm and reasonable she was, assured the king that he could not venture to undertake a cure, but placed his head at his majesty's disposal, on which the justly irritated monarch promptly had it cut off. This was the first of many suitors for the princess, whose inability to cure her cost them their lives. Now it happened that after things had been going on in this way for some time, the nurse's son, Marzavan, returned from his travels. 
He had been in many countries and learned many things, including astrology. Needless to say, that one of the first things his mother told him was the sad condition of the princess, his foster sister. Marzavan asked if she could not manage to let him see the princess without the king's knowledge. After some consideration, his mother consented, and even persuaded the eunuch on guard to make no objection to Marzavan's entering the royal apartment. The princess was delighted to see her foster brother again, and after some conversation, she confided to him all her history and the cause of her imprisonment. Marzavan listened with downcast eyes and the utmost attention. When she had finished speaking, he said, If what you tell me, princess, is indeed the case, I do not despair of finding comfort for you. Take patience yet a little longer. I will set out at once to explore other countries, and when you hear of my return, be sure that he for whom you sigh is not far off. So saying, he took his leave and started next morning on his travels. Marzavan journeyed from city to city and from one island and province to another, and wherever he went he heard people talk of the strange story of the Princess Badura, as the Princess of China was named. After four months, he reached a large populous seaport town named Torf, and here he heard no more of the Princess Badura, but a great deal of Prince Kamar al-Zaman, who was reported ill and whose story sounded very similar to that of the Princess Badura. Marzavan was rejoiced and set out at once for Prince Kamar al-Zaman's residence. The ship on which he embarked had a prosperous voyage till she got within sight of the capital of King Shah Zaman. But when just about to enter the harbor, she suddenly struck on a rock and foundered within sight of the palace where the prince was living with his father and the grand vizier. Marzavan, who swam well, threw himself into the sea and managed to land close to the palace, where he was kindly received, and after having a change of clothing given him, was brought before the grand vizier. The vizier was at once attracted by the young man's superior air and intelligent conversation, and perceiving that he had gained much experience in the course of his travels, he said, Ah, how I wish you had learned some secret which might enable you to cure a malady which has plunged this court into affliction for some time past. Marzavan replied that if he knew what the illness was, he might possibly be able to suggest a remedy, on which the vizier related to him the whole history of Prince Kamar al-Zaman. On hearing this, Marzavan rejoiced inwardly, for he felt sure that he had at last discovered the object of the Princess Badura's infatuation. However, he said nothing, but begged to be allowed to see the prince. On entering the royal apartment, the first thing which struck him was the prince himself, who lay stretched out on his bed, with his eyes closed. The king sat near him, but without paying any regard to his presence, Marzavan exclaimed, Heavens, what a striking likeness! And indeed there was a good deal of resemblance between the features of Kamar al-Zaman and those of the princess of China. These words caused the prince to open his eyes with languid curiosity, and Marzavan seized this moment to pay him his compliments, contriving at the same time to express the condition of the princess of China in terms unintelligible indeed to the sultan and his vizier, but which left the prince in no doubt that his visitor could give him some welcome information. The prince begged his father to allow him the favor of a private interview with Marzavan, and the king was only too pleased to find his son taking an interest in anyone or anything. As soon as they were left alone, Marzavan told the prince the story of the princess Badura and her sufferings, adding, I am convinced that you alone can cure her. But before starting on so long a journey, you must be well and strong, so do your best to recover as quickly as may be. These words produced a great effect on the prince, who was so much cheered by the hopes held out 
that he declared he felt able to get up and be dressed. The king was overjoyed at the result of Marzavan's interview and ordered public rejoicings in honor of the prince's recovery. Before long, the prince was quite restored to his original state of health. And as soon as he felt himself really strong, he took Marzavan aside and said, Now is the time to perform your promise. I am so impatient to see my beloved princess once more that I am sure I shall fall ill again if we do not start soon. The one obstacle is my father's tender care of me, for, as you may have noticed, he cannot bear me out of his sight. Prince, replied Marzavan, I have already thought over the matter, and this is what seems to me the best plan. You have not been out of doors since my arrival. Ask the king's permission to go with me for two or three days hunting, and when he is given leave, order two good horses to be held ready for each of us. Leave all the rest to me. Next day, the prince seized a favorable opportunity for making his request, and the king gladly granted it on condition that only one night should be spent out of fear for too great fatigue after such a long illness. Next morning, Prince Kamar al-Zaman and Marzavan were off betimes, attended by two grooms leading the two extra horses. They hunted a little by the way, but took care to get as far from the towns as possible. At nightfall, they reached an inn, where they supped and slept till midnight. Then Marzavan awoke and roused the prince without disturbing anyone else. He begged the prince to give him the coat he had been wearing and to put on another, which they had brought with them. They mounted their second horses, and Marzavan led one of the groom's horses by the bridle. By daybreak, our travelers found themselves where four crossroads met in the middle of the forest. Here Marzavan begged the prince to wait for him, and leading the groom's horse into a dense part of the wood, he cut its throat, dipped the prince's coat in its blood, and having rejoined the prince, threw the coat on the ground where the roads parted. In answer to Kamar al-Zaman's inquiries as to the reason for this, Marzavan replied that the only chance they had of continuing their journey was to divert attention by creating the idea of the prince's death. Your father will doubtless be plunged into the deepest grief, he went on, but his joy at your return will be all the greater. The prince and his companion now continued their journey by land and sea, and as they had brought plenty of money to defray their expenses, they met with no needless delays. At length, they reached the capital of China, where they spent three days in a suitable lodging to recover from their fatigues. During this time, Marzavan had an astrologer's dress prepared for the prince. Then they went to the baths, after which the prince put on the astrologer's robe and was conducted within sight of the king's palace by Marzavan, who left him there and went to consult with his mother, the princess's nurse. Meantime, the prince, according to Marzavan's instructions, advanced close to the palace gates, and there proclaimed aloud, I am an astrologer, and I come to restore the health of Princess Badura, daughter of the high and mighty king of China, on the conditions laid down by his majesty of marrying her should I succeed, or of losing my life if I fail. It was some little time since anyone had presented himself to run the terrible risk involved in attempting to cure the princess, and a crowd soon gathered round the prince. On perceiving his youth, good looks, and distinguished bearing, everyone felt pity for him. "'What are you thinking of, sir?' exclaimed some. "'Why expose yourself to certain death?' Are not the heads you see exposed on the town walls sufficient warning? For mercy's sake, give up this mad idea and retire whilst you can. But the prince remained firm and only repeated his cry with greater assurance to the horror of the crowd. He is resolved to die, they cried. May heaven have pity on him. Kamar al-Zaman now called out for the third time 
and at last the Grand Vizier himself came out and fetched him in. The Prime Minister led the prince to the king, who was much struck by the noble air of this new adventurer, and felt such pity for the fate so evidently in store for him that he tried to persuade the young man to renounce his project. But Kamar al-Zaman politely yet firmly persisted in his intentions, and at length the king desired that the eunuch who had the guard of the princess's apartments to conduct the astrologer to her presence. The eunuch led the way through long passages, and Kamar al-Zaman followed rapidly, in haste to reach the object of his desires. At last they came to a large hall, which was the anteroom to the princess's chamber. And here Kamar al-Zaman said to the eunuch, Now you shall choose. Shall I cure the princess in her own presence, or shall I do it from here without seeing her? The eunuch, who had expressed many contemptuous doubts as they came along of the newcomer's powers, was much surprised and said, If you really can cure, it is immaterial when you do it. Your fame will be equally great. Very well, replied the prince. Then, impatient though I am to see the princess, I will effect the cure where I stand, the better to convince you of my power. He accordingly drew out his writing case and wrote as follows. Adorable princess, the enamored Kamar al-Zaman has never forgotten the moment when, contemplating your sleeping beauty, he gave you his heart. As he was at that time deprived of the happiness of conversing with you, he ventured to give you his ring as a token of his love, and to take yours in exchange, which he now encloses in this letter. Should you deign to return it to him, he will be the happiest of mortals. If not, he will cheerfully resign himself to death, seeing he does so for love of you. He awaits your reply in your anteroom. Having finished this note, the prince carefully enclosed the ring in it without letting the eunuch see it, and gave him the letter, saying, Take this to your mistress, my friend. And if on reading it and seeing its contents, she is not instantly cured, you may call me an impudent impostor. The eunuch at once passed into the princess's room, and handing her the letter, said, Madam, a new astrologer has arrived, who declares that you will be cured as soon as you have read this letter and seen what it contains. The princess took the note and opened it with languid indifference. But no sooner did she see her ring then, barely glancing at the writing, she rose hastily and with one bound reached the doorway and pushed back the hangings. Here she and the prince recognized each other, and in a moment they were locked in each other's arms, where they tenderly embraced, wondering how they came to meet at last after so long a separation. The nurse, who had hastened after her charge, drew them back to the inner room, where the princess restored her ring to Kamar al-Zaman. Take it back, she said. I could not keep it without returning yours to you, and I am resolved to wear that as long as I live. Meantime, the eunuch had hastened back to the king. Sire, he cried, all the former doctors and astrologers were mere quacks. This man has cured the princess without even seeing her. He then told all to the king, who, overjoyed, hastened to his daughter's apartments, where, after embracing her, he placed her hand in that of the prince, saying, Happy stranger, I keep my promise, and give you my daughter to wife, be you who you may. But if I am not much mistaken, your condition is above what you appear to be. The prince thanked the king in the warmest and most respectful terms, and added, As regards my person, your majesty has rightly guessed that I am not an astrologer. It is but a disguise which I assumed in order to merit your illustrious alliance. I myself am a prince. My name is Kamar al-Zaman, and my father is Shah Zaman, king of the Isles of the Children of Khaladan. He then told his whole story, including the extraordinary manner of his first seeing and loving the Princess Badura. When he had finished, 
the king exclaimed, so remarkable a story must not be lost to posterity. It shall be inscribed in the archives of my kingdom and published everywhere abroad. The wedding took place next day amidst great pomp and rejoicings. Marzavan was not forgotten, but was given a lucrative post at court with a promise of further advancement. The prince and princess were now entirely happy, and months slipped by unconsciously in the enjoyment of each other's society. That was part one of the adventures of Prince Kamar al-Zaman and the Princess Badura, from the Arabian Nights Entertainments, selected and edited by Andrew Lang. Special thanks to Ginger Sands for our theme music. You can find more of Ginger's music at iTunes or on her website at www.gingersands.com. And if you'd like to comment on today's story, send me an email. I can be reached at susan.polter, that's P-O-U-L-T-E-R, at nashville.gov. Thanks for listening.